Hey everyone, Mr. Schachter here to talk about rates of change and limits. Uh, objectives of this video, uh, first of all, to know the difference between a limit value and a function value, and second of all, to find limit values graphically, algebraically, and logically. So first off, why do we study limits? Reason number one, they help us calculate the slope of a curve at any point, which is very useful. Second of all, they help us answer some interesting questions, uh, such as, will the population of the Earth continue to grow exponentially, or is there a limiting value? Um, or will any human ever break the nine second mark in the 100 meter dash? So limits help us answer these questions. A big key idea, uh, a limit value. Limit value is different from a function value, okay? These are different ideas. Limit values are all about approaching a certain number, whereas a function value is the, is the actual evaluation at that point. Notationally, uh, f of zero is equal to one. This right here is your function value. So the function's value at x equals zero is one. And then this right here is limit notation. Um, we say out loud the limit as x approaches zero of f of x is equal to zero. Um, we also can do partial limits where we include a, a plus or a minus. So the limit as x approaches zero from the right of f of x uh, might also be zero. So this little indication from the positive side is an indication we're coming from the right. And if I change that to a negative, we're coming from the left as well. Um, Second big key idea, for a limit to exist at some value of x, the limit from the right must equal the limit from the left. So suppose I have this, um, this value, the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x. Let's say we want to equal 2. Um, for this to be true, the limit as x approaches 1 from the right of f of x has to be 2. And the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of f of x has to be 2. Um, and if these, if these both partial limits are equal to each other, then uh, the limit itself will exist and will equal to. Um, if, for example, one of these is not the same as the other, let's say this was 3, um, then what we say is that the limit does not exist, often abbreviated D and E, or you can write the words uh, does not exist. Okay, so we need limit values to always, of course, equal, always equal each other. Okay, left and right. Let's take a look at these questions. Now, um, you may have some experience working with these uh, graphical limits, so I'm going to give you a second to solve these. Okay, let's go over them. We have A, the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the right of f of x is 1. So here's negative 1 right here. And if we come from the right side, we're coming from this side. And the question is, is that value equal to 1? Yes, we are approaching 1. That is true. Okay, so that's true. B, uh, the limit as x approaches 0 from the left of f of x is 0. Well, here's 0 from the left. The question is, are we going towards 0? Yes, we are. That's absolutely true. C. The limit as x approaches 0 from the left is 1. All right, well, here's 0 from the left. Here's 0 from the left. And uh, we just said that was 0, so that's clearly false. It's not going to 1. It is going to 0, as we just said in B. Uh, D, the limit as x approaches 0 from the left is equal to the limit as x approaches 0 from the right. This is definitely true. Right here's the left, here's the right. Both sides are approaching 0, so this is true. And therefore, letter E uh, is just the exact definition of, of D. D tells us that E is true. The limit from the left equals the limit from the right, and therefore, the limit as we approach 0 exists. Okay. Uh, F, the limit as x approaches 0 of f of x is equal to 0. Um, this right here is exactly a little bit more specific than letter E. This is the answer. That's a bad arrow. We'll redraw that. This is the answer. Yes, this is true. It is equal to 0. Okay. Uh, letter uh, G, the limit as x approaches 0 of f of x is 1. This is clearly false. Um, if you look at the picture, you see how this is shaded in right here? Um, what this is actually proving in the picture is that the function value at 0 is 1, not the limit value. The limit value from both sides is 0. So the limit as x approaches 0 of f of x is 0. So this is a really important idea, right? The function value and the limit value are very different and can often be different values. So that's going to be uh, false for g. g is false. Uh, h, the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x is equal to 1. That's going to be this. Uh, so we're going 1 this time, the limit as we approach 1. Well, here's 1. From the left, it looks like it's 1. From the right, it looks like it's 0. So therefore, the limit as we approach 1 actually does not exist. So it cannot be 1. That's false. 
i. Let's erase this picture. The limit as x approaches 1 of f of x is 0, clearly false. We just stated it does not exist. And j, the limit as x approaches 2 from the left is 2. Here's 2 from the left is, uh, looks like it's, it's supposed to be, this wants it to be 2, this is false, because we know that it's 0. Here's the 0 value right here. We're approaching that, uh, approaching that right there from the left. It's 0. So that's false. Wonderful. So now let's take a look at finding uh, limits algebraically. So um, some limits are found by simply plugging the value into the function. This is called direct substitution. For example, if I'm concerned with this limit right here, as x approaches 3, one thing I could do is just plug 3 into the function. So 3 squared minus 3 times 3 minus 18 all divided by 3 plus 3. So what I did is I just took the 3 and I plugged it into all of my x values and I'm just going to solve. So I believe the numerator works out to negative 18, the denominator 6, giving you a solution of negative 3. Final answer, negative 3. But oftentimes, you can't just plug the limit right in. You might get 0 divided by 0, which of course in mathematics is, uh, is undefined. Um, you might think that that's, that's the reason or uh, <coughs> that yields a non-existent limit. But actually, uh, using some kind of algebraic tricks, it, it actually can be solved. And here are just some examples. Um, you might be able to factor. You might be able to expand inside the, um, the limit. You might be able to rationalize either the numerator or the denominator. You might be able to find a common denominator. You might be able to multiply by a conjugate. These are just some examples of simplification that may help solve a limit problem. Let's try some. Number one, the limit as x approaches negative 3 of this rational function. To be honest, it looks like the numerator could be factored, so I'd like to do that. A very important point, though. Um, since I have not yet used direct substitution and plugged my limit in, um, let me just erase that. Uh, I have to keep writing the limit as x approaches, <coughs> excuse me, negative 3. So until I actually go and plug my negative 3 in here, I have to keep writing this limit expression. Of course, I cannot plug negative 3 in right now because the denominator would be negative 3 plus 3, which is 0, and a 0 in the denominator is undefined. So I have to algebraically simplify somehow in order to solve this. Uh, the numerator does factor. It looks like it's a relatively easy trinomial. x minus 6, x plus 3 the denominator being x plus 3, which is super nice because then this x plus 3 and this x plus 3 wipe each other out, leaving me with the limit as x approaches negative 3 of x minus 6 is my new problem. Well, now I can just do a direct substitution, right? I can do a direct substitution and solve the problem. So I can say that the answer is just simply, if I plug negative 3 in, it's just negative 3 minus 6. And so the final answer is negative 9. So the limit is equal to negative 9. Let's try this one. Uh, this one looks like a common denominator is pretty clear in the bottom. I'm going to try to get that. In order to get that, I need to multiply the left expression by 2 over 2 and the right expression by x plus 2 over x plus 2. Of course, the common denominator is a product of the denominators in most cases. So I have not yet used my limit. So I'm going to rewrite limit x approaches 0 of 2 over 2x two plus 2 minus x plus 2 over 2 times x plus 2. Now I'm going to teach you a trick with this, um, this x on the bottom here. Instead of writing divided by x and having fractions within fractions, um, I recommend actually just writing a multiplication of 1 over x for the entire problem. And the reason why I recommend this is, um, is because, I, actually I should be really careful with my parentheses here, I'm actually taking the limit of the whole expression. So just be cautious, um, make sure your limit is on the outside here. Um, but anyways, this is actually really helpful. It eliminates the fractions within fractions and often simplifies the expression further. Let's uh, see what we can do. Limit as x approaches 0. I'm going to simplify the numerator here, so I've got 2 minus x plus 2. So that's going to simplify to 2 minus x minus 2 on top, 2 times x plus 2 on the bottom, multiply by 1 over x, and I'm taking the limit of all of this stuff here. Um, very nice that 2 minus 2 is 0. See you later. So this now simplifies to the limit as x approaches 0. These are all equal uh, to negative x over 2x plus 2 times 1 over x.
and super nice but the negative x and the x can simplify, right? I can just divide by x. So my expression is now going to be, I'm going to try to squeeze it in here. My expression is now the limit as x approaches 0 of negative 1 over 2 times x plus 2. And now what I can do is actually apply my 0 right in there and solve the limit. So I'm just going to get the answer. I don't need to write the limit anymore because I'm going to plug in the 0. So the answer is negative 1 over 2 times 0 plus 2, which is just simply equal to negative 1 over 2 times 2, which is negative 1 over 4. So negative 1 fourth is the answer to the limit. Let's try this one. This one is the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the left of the greatest integer function. Okay, And the greatest integer function, of course, like the greatest integer function of 0 is 0, um, of 0 0.1 is 0. And 0 point, uh, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4 is 0, and it kind of keeps going into 0 0.999, which is still 0. And then when you get to 1, the greatest integer is now 1. So this looks like a stepping function. So let's just delete all of this, and let's see if we can sketch a brief picture. So um, we have right here the greatest integer of uh, 0 is going to be 0, and then we're going to kind of go until we get to this value, and then jump up and go until we get to this value, and so on and so forth, reciprocating this pattern. Um, and so we'll kind of do it down here as well. And we'll do it down here as well. And so the values I'm actually looking for is I'm looking for the limit as x approaches negative 2, which is right, this is negative 1, this is negative 2. But I'm approaching from the left. So interestingly enough, I'm going to need to drop another iteration of the function. So we'll do it right here. As we approach negative 2 from the left, we're actually coming in over here. We're coming in right here. Because this is approaching negative 2 from the right. And this is approaching down here. This is approaching negative 2 from the left. So the answer to the question is actually negative 3. The answer to the question is, yeah, I'm actually just going to write it right down here, is negative 3. So the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the left of the greatest integer function is negative 3. If I were to have done the limit, as x approaches negative 2 from the right of, uh, oops, so I'm just used to do an f of x, we'll just do int x. Um, this time, this would actually be negative 2 because we're coming in from the right side. And then if I were to ask the limit as x approaches negative 2 in general of the greatest integer function, uh, that would not exist because, of course, the, the left bound and the right bound are not the same value. All right?